Hello, how are you all today? My name is Sonny Kim, or you can just call me Sonny. And I study pre-modern history of Korea, or Seoul, and now I work for the National Institute of Korean History. Uh, I have been delivering this meaningful lecture since 2020 with Yale Foundation, but actually this is the very first time that I'm doing it in person because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I am very happy and excited to finally be able to talk with you. So <laughs> hope you all have fun today. Yeah, let me give you a brief rundown on today's lecture. Uh, the title of today's lecture is, as you can see, Encountering History in the Heart of the City. Uh, literally, you may encounter the traces of the past almost anywhere you go in this city. But among those like, past traces, the palaces, I think, is the easiest uh, traces to spot. And, but some of you might wonder why there are so many palaces in this small city. And what's the difference? What the difference among them are? And maybe some of you are not really familiar with the history of Joseon Dynasty. So I will start uh, with a brief introduction to the Joseon Dynasty history and then delve into the uh, construction process of the five palaces so that you can see the general idea of those like five grand palaces and so on. And then I will like delve into the, uh, let's say, aesthetic appeal or distinctive features of some palaces located in Seoul, uh, especially focusing on the two representative palaces, one Gyeongbokgung Palace and Changdeokgung Palace. As you might know, uh, Joseon Dynasty was founded in 1392, and it became or transformed into Korean Empire in 1897. But sadly, in 1910, it was annexed by the Imperial Japan. So Seoul served as the capital of the dynasty for more than five centuries. Five centuries, right? 500 years, right? So it's natural that there are so many historical relics in this still remaining this city. Uh, in like 1394, the capital was moved to Seoul from Gaesong. Gaesong was the old capital of the predecessor Goryeo Dynasty. The founder king Taejo Yi Songge moved capital to Hanyang in 1394. And Seoul was then called Hanyang or Hansung, which means the north of the Han River or the capital prefecture. And this is the map of Hanyang, uh, which was created in mid 18th century. This was the original Seoul. It is quite different from the today's Seoul, right? And you can see here Namsan and Inwangsan, uh, no, Bukaksan or Baegaksan, and Inwangsan and Naksan. And here or right here, Namdaemun. If you're familiar with this city, you will notice what I'm talking about, right? And there's like Cheonggye Stream in the center of the city. So this was the original like uh, Hansong or Hanyang, and there were like the Han River running down here. So Gangnam wasn't part of the Seoul city at the time, so it was much smaller. And weirdly, in this relatively small city, there are so many palaces, I would say five palaces. There were more because like, there were like some residences for princes or some smaller uh, palaces. But I will just talk about like five grand palaces. So there is like Gyeongbokgung, maybe one of the most iconic landmark of the city. And it became more iconic when BTS performed 
in this uh, palace. And then there is uh, Changdeokgung in to the east of the Gyeongbokgung Palace. And there is Changdeokgung right next to the Changdeokgung Palace. And to the west of the Gyeongbokgung Palace, there is Gyeongbokgung. And we are right here. This ground, this area, used to be the ground of uh, Gyeongbokgung Palace. And there is Doksugung Palace. So, I would say these are the five grand palaces. And they are all located in the central, so Jongnogu or Jinggu. Uh, spanning from 1392 to 1910, uh, Joseon Dynasty is one of the longest, uh, held one of the longest reigns uh, in world history. But still, in this small city, why there are so many uh, palaces? was the ruler of the dynasty had a tendency to immigration, such as wrong there. Uh, so uh, to find a solution or answer to this question, we will like, go, into, go right into the history and uh, philosophy behind the construction of the palaces. You might think the one massive, well-constructed palace is enough, right? But it, uh, having just one uh, single massive uh, palace in the capital city might cause some problem. Uh, one such problem is uh, when the king needed an alternative like uh, spaces in case of war, plague, or fire, or something like that. But you know, naturally, the king could not use or utilize the commoner's house, right? So king had to have some alternatives. And in fact, during the course of the Joseon dynasty history, uh, Joseon witnessed many destructions of palaces. Uh, some of you might know. Uh, for example, the Gyeongbokgung Palace and Changdeokgung and Changdeokgung Palace was totally disrupted when the Japanese invaded. Joseon Dynasty in 1592. So, like to like rebuild the destroyed palaces or fix the existing palaces. Throughout the course of the long history of the dynasty, there became multiple uh, palaces, and the ruler operated many palaces. So, uh, it wasn't about the uh, king of or ruler of the dynasty or had a tendency uh, of immigration or exorbitance or something like that. It was because there are many reasons to have multiple uh, buildings. And in fact, uh, Joseon kings were well known for their commitment for frequency. So one such example is that when Gyeongbokgung was destroyed by the Japanese invaders, they decided not to recreate the palace. And they opted instead to uh, recreate, recreate Changdeokgung Palace. And they used it as a main palace almost like for almost 300 years. It was because even though Gyeongbokgung was the first and primary palace, to reveal the massive palace would cause a huge amount of trouble of the people and money. So the ruler of the Joseon dynasty wanted to save the effort of the people. So it shows how they are into like having modest lifestyle, even though they are a top ruler or uh, ruling class of the dynasty. So maybe we, sh we should not think too bad about having too many palaces in this small city. Maybe instead uh, we can be thankful that we have this uh, beautiful and significant uh, historical relics in our city. I told you there are five grand palaces and these are the brief history of the construction of the palace. And Gyeongbokgung Palace was the first built and the primary palace of the Joseon dynasty. Have you ever heard about uh, Jonggung or Popgung or Igung or Hengung? Some of you know about the word, uh, some of you not. 
there were many palaces, but they had different status. And in like uh, historical term, Bokgung or Cheonggung was the primary palace. So there was only one primary palace in a kingdom. But as I mentioned, you know, the king needed more than one primary palace. So they built detached palace, which complement uh, one primary palace. So it is called Yigung in Korean. And there is another palace called Hengung. Maybe some of you heard about Suwon Hengung, Bukhan Sanzong Hengung, or something like that. Uh, when king travels, he should have some place to sleep and eat, right? So here and there, there are like a small sized uh, palace built in the main road of the um, country. So in Suwon, or Naman Sansong, or Bukhan Sansong, and there were small palace called Hengu. So king could use uh, while he was traveling, or even when there was a war, he had to evacuate to the fortress. So there was like Hengu, Naman Sansong, Naman fortress Hengu, and Bukhan fortress Hengu. So it is natural to have such uh, status and uh, category of palaces. Uh, even though the uh, Gyeongbokgung Palace was well constructed in 1395, King Taejong, the third ruler of the Joseon Dynasty, built uh, Changdokgung Palace uh, as the first detached palace of the Joseon Dynasty. Uh, there was a long history behind the construction of the Changdokgung Palace because, like you know, when the King Taejong, the third ruler of the Joseon Dynasty, becoming a king. There was a, a huge conflict between him and his family. So he ended up killing many of his brothers. And the founder of King Lee sung was so upset about him. So he actually went back to Kaesong and their long history. But uh, long story short, uh, all those bad things happened in Gyeongbokgung Palace. So King Taejong didn't really like living in Gyeongbokgung Palace. So he had to build another palace called Changdeokgung Palace in 1405. And in 1484, uh, the Changdeokgung Palace was not big enough to house the expanding royal family. So right next to the Changdeokgung Palace, they built Changdeokgung Palace. And actually, Changdeokgung Palace and Changdeokgung Palace are recognized as one big palace complex, which is called Dongwal, or East Palace. So if you go into, or if you go visit Changdeokgung Palace, you can actually move into uh, Changdeokgung Palace. Maybe not paying extra money or fee, I believe. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, it's one huge uh, palace complex. And they even share one beautiful garden together. So I will talk about it later. Uh, this picture is maybe the, the oldest existing uh, picture of Gyeongbokgung before it was ruined by the Japanese, Japanese invasion. So this is the throne hall, Gunjongjong, and there's a huge courtyard. And maybe these are Baegaksan, Bugaksan, or Eungbong. And yeah, I was going to talk about Gyeonggi-gung. Actually, we are uh, in this picture right now. Maybe somewhere around here. So this museum, the Seoul Museum of History, is built in the territory of old Gyeonggi-gung ground. So we are around here. And maybe after this lecture is over, maybe you can visit this spot, the existing the section of Gyeonggi-gung, you can easily visit the palace and look around. Even though it's small, it's beautiful. And uh, there is also some interesting history behind the construction of Gyeonggi-gung. Because the Queen's, uh, Crown Prince Kwang He was advised by his fortune tellers that uh, there is one residence of Prince Jeongwon, Jeongwon-gun, and the fortune teller 
told the king that uh, he believes that there is some spirit of king in that residence. So if you just leave it alone, maybe there will be rebellion and you will be kicked out of the throne. So advised by the fortune terror, he built this huge palace right on this spot. But unfortunately, or ironically, uh, he could not use this palace because he was dethroned in 1623 by the son of the owner of the original residence located right here, King Injo, the 16th ruler of the Joseon dynasty. So it's, I, I'm not so sure it's a real fact or some people made the history, but um gung had some bad origins like that, so I'll talk about it in detail later, but gung gung suffered uh, so many destruction during the uh, Joseon dynasty because um, they sometimes disassemble some palace buildings to use it to build another palace, and they didn't really like this palace. So maybe there's a reason the existing Gyeonggi Gung right there is so uh, existing size. And there's the last one, Doksu Gung. It was used to be called Gyeonggi Gung. And I wrote down that Gyeonggi Gung, Gung was built in 1907. But it was actually a residence of Prince and it was built much earlier than this. But as I mentioned, the Korean Empire, the Joseon dynasty became transformed into the Korean Empire in uh, 1897. The first emperor of the Joseon or Korean Empire, King Gojong or Emperor Gojong, was uh, for, forced to, to dethrone by the Imperial Japan in 1907. So he then had to move his location or his residence from Gyeongbokgung to Dokseung. And at the time, uh, it was not, the, the name of the palace was Gyeongbokgung, but they changed the name into Dokseung, uh, wishing the longevity of the retired emperor. You see this like stone building, right? It doesn't look like a traditional Korean palace building. Right? So when the emperor, retired emperor resided in this palace, he renovated and built many new buildings, some buildings in a uh, Western style. So you can still see some Westernized style building in this uh, palace. Now, like, you know, there are, we can like always visit the beautiful palaces nowadays anytime you want, but you know, the palaces wasn't always in the form that we are seeing right now because there are long history of suffering of them during the course of the Joseon dynasty. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, by the Japanese invaders in uh, 1592, many palace buildings, including Gyeongbokgung and Changdeokgung, Changdeokgung were destroyed. And this painting uh, created in 1767, uh, describing the empty spot, empty ground of the throne of the Gyeongbokgung. I will go back to the older painting here. It's the throne of Gyeongjeon, right? Uh, this newer painting is des describing the same spot, but there's no building. So I, I, as I mentioned, uh, the Gyeongbokgung was ruined by the Japanese invaders and remained in ruins for almost like about 300 years. So at the time, it was empty space, but the stone foundation was still there. So the King Yongjo held a party for his officers right there. But you know, in the uh, late 1800s, uh, the first emperor, King Gojong, he actually recreated uh, Gyeongbokgung Palace to his original form. So this painting uh, created in 1915, somewhat showing the recreation of the Gyeongbokgung Palace. So there's many trees and many buildings 
beautifully described. But unfortunately, uh, Gyeongbokgung had to face another destruction when the Korean Empire was annexed by Imperial Japan in 1910. The Japanese rulers decided to use Gyeongbokgung Palace as for their headquarters of uh, Japanese general in Korea. So this whole ground used to be filled with many buildings are now almost empty. Only few main structures of the Gyeongbokgung Palace survived the time. And even worse than that, they built this humongous headquarter right in front of the throne hall. So I mentioned earlier that the Gyeongbokgung was the primary palace of the Joseon dynasty, so which means it was a symbol of the Joseon dynasty, but it lost its identity because of the, of the destruction caused by the Japanese rulers at the time. Unfortunately, <laughs> the recreation, renovation, or re reconstruction of the Gyeongbokgung Palace uh, were initiated uh, in the late 1990s, and it is still ongoing. So there are so many progress. So including the throne hall and Gwanghamun Gate, uh, the residence pool, the crown screens, and living quarters of the Gyeongbokgung were all renovated. And recently, the platform, the moon platform, or Wolde in Korean, of the uh, Gwanghamun Gate is also uh, renovated. So the renovation or recrush, recreation of the palace is still ongoing. So we'll see more and more of the original feature of the palace. When I visited like uh, Gyeongbokgung when I was younger, I remember it was a huge empty place. <laughs> Recently I went there and I was surprised by um, many buildings. So yeah, I would recommend you to go there sometimes. Actually, like, you know, talking about palaces, uh, it's better to actually visit and talk about the palace right in there rather than talk about it in Korea, uh, in class. So I hope uh, in the future there's a chance that we can actually go out and take a look around the beautiful palaces. Yeah, it will be more fun. This is the, the entrance of the Gyeonggi-gung Palace, Hung uh, You can easily see this path, the gate, because right, it's right there, right? There? Right there. I am. It must be there. But this is not the original uh, entrance to the Gyeonggi Palace. The original gate still existing, but not right here. It is now being used as the main entrance of the Shilla Hotel in near Nansan. So they, uh, during the Japanese colonial time, they disassembled this uh, gate and sold it to somebody. So the gate, the, the original gate ended up in the Shilla Hotel. And this gate is renovated, renovated maybe in early 2000. And I mentioned that Gyeonggi Gung wasn't really prepared by the kings of the Joseon dynasty. So uh, it, the, most of the buildings were disassembled or ruined, uh, destroyed. And so the existing size of the Gyeonggi is very small. And hopefully in the future it will be uh, renovated so that we can see the original feature of the Gyeonggi Palace. And Doksugung Palace, I mentioned earlier, also had to suffer many uh, demolitions uh, during the course of the early uh, 20th century, the rapid upheaval of political situation. So many buildings were ruined and demolished, and the size of the palace ground was shrunk uh, to a certain degree. And this uh, building is called Jungmyeong Jeon Ho. Uh, of the Doksugung Palace. Uh, this building, kind of westernized uh, style building, had, has a great significance of the Joseon Venice history because this is where the annexation treaty between Korean and Japanese 
and fires were made in 1910. So it has great significant, historical significant, significant. But this was this building was sold maybe in 1960 or 70s to an individual. So it wasn't even a part of uh, the palace for so many years. And then in, around like 2010 or something, they decided to buy this building from the individual and renovate it into the original form. So now we can visit this uh, museum building and now it's also used as a museum, a uh, palace building and it is also now used as a museum. Just like across the street from here, the main street, you will like walk out to this very easily. And there are good coffee shops around here, so I have you find you to go there. Yeah. I talked about the sufferings of the palace enough, so maybe we can talk about some brighter side of that. There are so many, uh, there are like palaces in, there are many palaces in Seoul. And if you just like, you know, like look around the palace, you will think they all look the same. The wooden structure, uh, some colorful paintings on the you know, part of the uh, roof like this, and tiled roof, they all look the same. But if you get closer and like, have a closer look, you will see the differences. For example, as I mentioned, the Gyeongpokgung Palace had a superior status as the uh, primary palace of the Joseon Dynasty, right? So even from the entrance of the, pa the Gyeongbokgung Palace, Gwanghamun, you can see the distinctive features, like this stone foundation. Gwanghamun Gate Pavilion is built on this high elevated uh, stone foundation with three arch entrance. And this structure is not be seen from any other palace gate. Let's go back to Gyeonggi-gung gate. This is the main entrance of the gyeonggi -gung, but is there a stone foundation or arch? No. Only gyeonggi had this uh, special feature. Maybe some of you visited, already visited these palaces, right? Yeah. Actually, there's a way you can see the status of the building. Uh, if the king resides in the, the building, the building had high uh, say this among all the palace buildings. It usually has this white decoration ribbon or something on the roof, and it is usually built on an elevated stone foundation. Yeah, this is the you know symbol of high you know, status of the building. Beside the architectural style, actually the formation of the uh, or design of the, the palace is also different according to the status of the palace. For instance, Gyeongpokgung Palace as the primary uh, palace of the Joseon Dynasty. Uh, the main structures of the palace are located along the line of the south-north axis. So if you go into Gwanghamun, to see the palace, as you walk through the gate, you will see more and more important palace buildings until you reach the living quarters of the palace. So it is kind of like try to show, it is designed to show the dignity or authority of the royal family, or royal, not, not royal family, royal power or king. And uh, you can also see this kind of layout of the palace from the Forbidden City in Beijing, or even the pre-modern palace in Vietnam, because uh, Vietnam, uh, Joseon, or Korea, and China share the same philosophy of palace construction. So if you go to the Forbidden City in Beijing, you will see the huge entrance, main entrance, and there must be some stream down here. And then you will see the throne hall, main hall. And you cannot see the stream from this picture, but the stream is the, how can I say, 
this uh, distinction between uh, normal people's world and the royal territory. So if you go to Gwanghamun Gate, uh, go into Gwanghamun, there is like uh, ticket booths, and you can go into Hungdaemun Gate, but you're not actually in the palace yet. You should across the bridge right here, stone bridge. It is called Gyeongjo. So Vietnam or China, you will always find the same structure. This is the the, the map or painting of the of the Eastern Palace. I, I mentioned earlier that Changdeokgung and Changgyeonggung to the to the east of the Gyeongbokgung Palace is called Donggol, right? This is the painting of the uh, Donggol, and here's like Changdeokgung and here's Changgyeonggung. And compared to the huge rectangular uh, layout of the Gyeongbokgung Palace, it shows more like natural settings of the uh, layout of the palace because it, uh, the two palaces located amid the gentle hills and the palace building layout is more like embracing the national uh, geography of the spot. So some people say that uh, Changdeokgung and Changgyeonggung has or is the showcase of the uh, special feature feature of the uh, Korean palace uh, construction, and we connect the the cultural value of the Changdeokgung, Changgyeonggung, or Donggol was recognized. So it is inscribed as the World Heritage Site of the UNESCO in 1997. So I will give you uh, detail, more detailed information of the Changdeokgung or the essence of the Korean uh, palace construction at the later part of the uh, lecture. Now I'm going to talk about uh, distinctive features or aesthetic appeal of two representative palaces. And first, I will talk about Tongbokgung Palace. This is the throne of the Dongbokgung Palace in the Drono Gyeongjang. This is the Drono Gyeongjang. Gyeongjang means diligent in state affairs. That is King's job, right? So all the palace buildings in Korea has such names. So it reminds the king or the rulers of their duties. So this is Gyeongjang. And as I mentioned, Gyeongjang uh, is the most formal, and uh, um, maybe with the highest status uh, among all the palace buildings in the Gyeongbokgung Palace. So it has special features. Now you cannot see because of the snow. There is like white decoration and two stories, and there is huge uh, stone foundation, and in front of the building there are like spacious courtyard. So uh, maybe some of you may heard about the term Zhuzhong. Zhuzhong. Zhuzhong literally means courtyard. And in, uh, during the Joseon dynasty, Zhuzhong meant government or the state. So this is Zhuzhong. This madam or courtyard was Zhuzhong. So it means like important state affairs happening right here. But Gyeongjong was not like a, a building for king to be engaged in his daily state affairs. Uh, this building was uh, prepared for uh, some important state affairs like enthronement of the king or uh, held holding ceremony for foreign envoys from China or some other places. So instead, there is like some council hall behind the conjunction. That's where King be engaged in his daily uh, affairs. You can see uh, if you get closer to the stone foundation of the conjunction hall, you will see some many statues of animals and flowers and lotus flowers and beautiful decorations of the. Uh, on the uh, platform or the banister surrounding the platform. So there are like four animals, like white tiger, blue dragon, 
black turtle and red phoenix or something, which is the symbol of four cardinal directions. And you, if you get closer, there are 12 animal symbols of Chinese zodiac. You all have your own animal. Mine is rooster. So there is like many like, uh, like imaginary or actual animal symbols. It means uh, the king is the ruler of the space and the earth. Uh, this like decoration is prepared to show the people that the authority of the uh, monarchy. And this is Gyeonghwaeru Pavilion. This is believed to believed to be one of the most beautiful space within Nongbokgung Palace. And Gyeonghwaeru is uh, where the king drug uh, grand banquet for his uh, officials or foreign envoys. So this beautiful pavilion is constructed in early 1400 for some official purpose. And there is a huge pond in front of the pavilion. While they were building this, constructing this pond, they excavated huge amount of dirt. And they used that dirt to build uh, artificial mound in the bed chamber of the king of the Gyeongbokgung Palace. So if you visit uh, the bed chamber or Qingzhen or Lejeon in Gyeongbokgung Palace, there is a real garden of the, the chamber and it's beautifully decorated with, with beautifully looking stones and beautiful flowers. It's called Anisan, named after some beautiful mountain of China. And I just mentioned the name Lejeon Bed chamber or living quarter is Nejeon, called Nejeon in Korean, or Jungjeon, Daejeon. If you are familiar with some historical, historical drama of Korea, you might heard the name Jungjeon, Jungjeon Mama, Daejeon Mama, something like that. In Joseon Dynasty, some people with higher status, they were not called by their name. They were called by the name of the building they are residing. So, Jungjeon Mama means the queen of the dynasty, and Jungjeon means the central building or palace building in the entire uh, palace. And you call king, Daejeon, means like the biggest building of the palace. So, and Mama, Mama. Dejon Mama. Mama means your, your majesty, your highness, or something like that. So respectful in name for the king. There is another uh, pond, large pond called Hangwonjong, or the Hangwonji uh, and Hangwonjong Pavilion in the pond. Uh, this is actually rear garden. Uh, this territory is uh, prepared as a rear garden of the Gyeongbokgung Palace when it was originally built in the earlier uh, part of Joseon Dynasty. But when the King Gojong, 26th ruler of the Joseon Dynasty and the first emperor of the Korean Empire, built his own residence in the northern side of the Gyeongbokgung Palace, which is called Gyeongcheonggung Residence in 1873, he built his like, beautiful pond and pavilion for his leisure time or something like that. Mm. So I mentioned that Gyeongmeiru was prepared for some official purpose, like you know, ceremony or banquets for foreign envoys. Uh, this beautiful pond and beautiful Hangwonjong pavilion is uh, created for king and queen's or private life or relaxation. So uh, during his reign, when the pond is like froze like this during the winter, they actually invited uh, the foreign envoys over and throw out a figure skating party or something like that right here. So it's very interesting. You, can, you cannot see the Gonchogong residence from this picture, but uh, there is huge residence in, uh, in front of the, the pond. That's where the electricity was first used in Korea, 
so it is called the birthplace of uh, electricity in of Korea. So at the time, the, the technicians from the states of the Edison company came over and you know installed some generators and light bulb and watchtowers and like that. So it's quite interesting. Now let's move on to the Changdeokgung. I, I go to the palace many times frequently. Every time I go to the Changdeokgung palace, I am like admired by its natural beauty. And I don't, I don't have enough work to describe the beauty of the palace. So I will just like give you uh, some brief information and some history about the palace. And you should go there if you haven't been there yet. Okay. And I, earlier, I mentioned the Changdeokgung Palace is called as the essence of Korean palace architecture. Uh, and I told you that it has somewhat more natural layout compared to the Gyeongbokgung Palace. But the throne of Injeongjeon, uh, throne of the Changdeokgung Palace called Injeongjeon, uh, which means benevolent in state affairs, uh, looks somewhat like Penjongjeon of the Gyeongbokgung Palace, right? So the main structures or main space of the Changdeokgung Palace is similar to the Gyeongbokgung Palace, the primary palace, because the purpose of these like, uh, formal building is same. This Injeongjeon Hall was also uh, created to hold some state ceremonies or a celebration for receiving foreign affairs. So they are quite similar, but overall Changdeokgung had very different distinctive feature. And this Injeongjeon Palace building looks not so special compared to the Gunjeongjeon Palace, the Gunjeongjeon Hall, the throne of the Gyeongbokgung. But if you get closer and take a closer look, you will see, uh, you cannot see from this picture, but if you visit the, the Injeongjeon Hall, you will see these uh, doors are decorated with glasses. And uh, the interior is decorated with curtains or hardwood floor and even light bulbs. So in late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, the, the whole entire palace went into some westernization, pro westernization process. So you can see some traces of the time. So it looks similar. It looks just like traditionally built uh, palace building, but inside of the buildings are somewhat different from Gyeongbokgung or other palaces. And this is called Gwolle Gaksa Complex. Gwolle uh, Gaksa. Uh, which means uh, various bureaus inside the palace. So inside the, the palace wall, there are so many people live, about like 3,000 or something like that, including royal families and his officials. So there must be some space for the officials to work, right? So these are the offices inside the mm, the Changdeokgung Palace. You can see the throne hall, and to the west of the throne hall, there is like offices, like this. And earlier I mentioned that you know uh, all the palace buildings has uh, have different like status, right? And one of the symbols of the the hierarchy is this like white decoration. But other buildings doesn't have the white decoration, so you can tell the differences between the main building of the section from just like low regular like office offices. So among these offices there were like royal libraries and royal publication office and uh, even a hospital for the king. So it's Gwolle Gaksa complex. Uh, it's, it is called Gwolle Gaksa complex. But this all the palaces like Gyeongbokgung, uh, Doksurung, they used to have Gwolle Gaksa complex. But now, only Changdeokgung has Gwolle complex. So it's a, a special example of the, uh, how they like, operate the palace during the Joseon dynasty. 
And this is the council hall of the Champakong Palace uh, to the east of the throne hall in Jeongjeon. It is called Sangjeongjeon. And you might notice that this building has a slightly different colored roof tiles. It's like blue tiled roof tiles. Uh, blue roof tiles. It's called Cheongwa. Cheongwa. And during the Joseon Dynasty, like they sometimes decorate the royal palace buildings with the blue tile roof tiles. But this is the only remaining example of the blue tiled uh, building. And you know, the presidential office of Republic of Korea used to be called Chongwade. Now it's moved to Yongsan, so it's not Chongwade anymore. But the reason the presidential office was called Chongwade was because like the main building of the president, presidential office was inspired by this building style, and it is actually decorated with blue tile. So it is, it is called Chongwa De. Oh, it's interesting. Actually, like you know, during the Joseon Dynasty, uh, I told you the palaces sometimes like uh, suffered so many fire and destruction by the, the war or something like that. So fire was uh, one of the most dangerous thing for the, you know, Joseon rulers. So they installed many symbol to, symbols to prevent the fire from occur. So you can see some bronze, uh, how can I say? They store some water in this like container and it is actually to be used to this this thing, how can extinct extinguish right yeah fire, and they also believe that the fire evil sometimes grow into the you know palace to destroy, it. but he spat his like face reflected on the water, he got scared and ran away, and this is uh, some mythical animal living in the water, so it means or symbolizes water. And you ask these like small status, A status, I, there is no concrete fact about the, or like specific explanation of the installment of these like creatures. But some people say there are like some uh, actual historical features from Chinese novel have you heard about like Sonokong or Samjangbopsa story? It is like I, I'm not like familiar with the, the detailed like uh, story, but the the one monk mastered in many Buddhist like classics or Buddhist canons. He traveled to India to find the Dharma or the like true teachings of the Buddha. At that time, he accompanied his like. Guardians or something like that? Yeah. Yep. Retainer. Yeah. To help him or to protect him. So some mon monkey called Sonogong, some wild boar called Chopalge, or some ghost, Sawojo. Yeah, you are maybe you're familiar with that story. Anyhow, some people say these say, status are like them. So Maybe because they had some superpowers, so they wanted to use the superpower to protect this palace. So that's why they installed this weird looking you know, creatures on the roof. But as I mentioned, no one knows the exact reason or meaning of the status. Maybe some of you can delve into the topic and find some solution, answer for that. On the, like the, on the on the northeastern side section of the palace, there are beautiful like, garden created in the Changdeokgung Palace, which is called by many names. Uh, some people call it Huwon, literally means rear garden, or Bukwon, northern garden, or secret garden, Kungwon. But now we are. The official name must be Huon, Rear Garden. 
So uh, the rear garden of the Changdeokgung Palace or Changdeokgung Palace. I, I mentioned that Changdeokgung and Changdeokgung share the garden of the palace were created in the, the early 1400 uh, for the queen and the king to have some rigid time at the getting away from the busy state affairs. So they carefully designed this garden with beautiful buildings and beautiful pond and beautiful trees and flowers and everything is so well harmonized. So this uh, whole section of the palace, rear garden, is uh, called to be the most uh, beautiful garden in the entire Korea uh, and showing the, the essence of Korean uh, Korean garden uh, construction, something like that. This is uh, uh, when uh, during the fall, autumn foliage, you can see colorful autumn foliage and you can see this like, beautiful winter scenery. And there is many different looking pavilions like this. Puyongjong, Erianjong. All the kings loved to take a stroll and have some party in this pond or on this pond and this like pal like pavilions. So as I mentioned, I don't have enough word to describe this beauty, the beauty of the rear garden of the Changdeokgung Palace. So you should visit if you haven't been there. <laughs> That's only one thing I can say. <laughs>